address address the, the group. I'm just uh, giving you a, a very warm welcome this evening. Thank you again um, to you all for your dedication and, and being here. You can uh, also use this time to uh, rename yourself if you are a CSE member. Um, as usual, we're asking for you to add a CSE in front of your, your name so that we're able to identify you as a committee member. And then um, something that was really helpful that some folks did was uh, write a CSE alternate if you are an alternate or, or you could also, um, if you're from a different organization, you can add um, your organization name after your your name as well. And we have the instructions up here. Um, on the top right of the slide that I'm sharing, you can see um, where you have to go to uh, rename yourself. And again, it's really important that we um, identify you. Um, and if you are in a house with um, multiple family members that are part of the CSC, um, if I know some people have also put in their name, who, el who else from that household is present. Um, you can try that as well. Um, you can send us a direct message if you wanna let us know that um, who, who else is in, in your household. Uh, you know, if you have other CAC members that are present, uh, you can send us a message to let us know as well. We're about a minute away from 5 p.m. So um, we're gonna go ahead and get started shortly, but do just wanna let you all know that we are starting the meetings at 4.45, um, or at least we did today and we're testing this out. Um, and moving forward, we, we wanna create, we hear that it's really helpful to have more avenues for you to have engagement with the Air District and with the community co-leads. So we are, carving the 15 minutes before this meeting to uh, have an open forum with community to share their ideas, concerns, questions. And so hopefully, um, you know, this was a test run, but again, we hope to, if this is something that um, you all feel is a useful uh, use of your time and, and that, you know, the space um, and the format works for you, then we will continue to join a little early so that you have uh, an opportunity to, you know, to connect with the folks in this group. But again, there's plenty of opportunities for you to um, also give your thoughts and, and share during today's meeting. So I'm gonna get us started. It looks like um, we have a lot of folks that have joined us already and I do see the both um, leads here. So if it's okay with the, with the district and the community co-leads, we can get started. I oh, I have a question. What industry is that Panama Road and Malaga Road? I think, hi, Laura. I think we'll, at the end when we have public comment, definitely we'll, we'll address your comment then. I wanted to address Daniela's question. I did see Daniela in the chat from Bianca that several folks, because we did have a, I think this is a new Zoom link. So um, several folks were in the old one. Bianca, do you know if everyone that was in that old one or clicked the old one, are they, um, do they have the right one now? Yes, I'm sending a message to everybody right now and, and updating the, the Zoom link. Awesome, great. Should we maybe wait like 30 more seconds, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think so, please. Yes, no problem, Bianca. Thank you for sharing that information out. 
and welcome to folks that continue to join us. Good evening. We'll get started in, in one more minute. Maybe we can give the instructions for the interpretation one more time. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Muchas gracias por reunirse a la reunión esta tarde. Uh, es para poder conectarse al canal de interpretación. Por favor, vaya al menú de abajo y donde ve el icono de mundo que dice interpretation, por favor, seleccione, haga clic y seleccione Spanish para poder escuchar el audio en español. Y una vez que haga eso, seleccione eh, la opción de mute original audio y eso significa que va a silenciar el audio original en inglés. Si quisiera escuchar la reunión por teléfono o tuviera problemas de conexión, puede llamar al número 844 867-6169 y por favor ponga el, el código de acceso 62798-53 más la tecla de número. Thank you, Yesenia. Muchas gracias, Yesenia. You're welcome. All right, I think we can, I do see only a couple more folks coming in, but uh, hopefully we can go through some of these housekeeping items and folks will continue to join us. Um, I'm gonna go back one slide and, and just give you another warm welcome. Again, thank you for joining us uh, for the eighth uh, AB617 meeting for Arvin Lamont community. Uh, we're so grateful that you're you're here today and, and you're engaging in a, a really important discussion today about air quality um, and air monitoring. So um, here before you, you see uh, a typical slide that you see in, in these meetings. I'll be sharing my screen to, to uh, share a few housekeeping items. Uh, for those that um, were not at the last meeting, my name is Daniela Flores from Harder & Company Community Research. And I'm also joined by my colleagues at Harder & Company, uh, Liz Lev and Dr. Amy Ramos. Uh, you'll see them on the screen as well. Um, we're here to support you as your facilitators. Uh, we had a really great discussion last, uh, last month um, and heard all your feedback about how we can show up uh, to be a supportive facilitator. And so we we're taking those notes down. You'll hear some updates today about the different processes that we'll have. And again, at any point, the invitation for you to be able to give us feedback remains open always. Um, so we hope that, that you feel comfortable sharing that feedback as well. Um, so here we just remind everyone, which everyone's doing this already, but I will remind folks one more time as you are not speaking, uh, feel, uh, make sure that you're muted. And um, if you do want to speak, though, make sure that you can um, unmute yourself. You will have, uh, if you're a CSC member, it'll be important for you to rename yourself with CSC in your name. Uh, we have the instructions on the top right for how you can go ahead and do that. Um, and you can, if you're from a different organization, we'll just ask that you add your organization name after your name. And that way for CSE members, it's again, so important that we're able to document uh, that you've been in attendance so that if you're part of the stipend program that you receive that stipend for this meeting. Okay, and I did see 10 more people join, so I'm gonna give this, I'm gonna ask uh, Yesenia if we can have this announcement one more time. Claro que sí, buenas tardes a todos, muchas gracias por reunirse esta tarde. Eh, para poder escuchar el audio de la reunión en español, por favor, elija el icono de mundo en el menú de abajo y seleccione la opción de Spanish, español. Después de eso, 
por favor elija la opción de Mute Original Audio y eso significa silenciar el audio original. Si usted tiene algún problema técnico o si quisiera escuchar la reunión en español, puede usar la línea de AT&T llamando al 844-867-6169 y por favor usa el código de acceso 6279853 más la tecla de número. Thank you, Yesenia. A few reminders. Um, if you are joining us on the phone, uh, make sure that you, if you want to unmute yourself, you can press star six. And if you would like to raise your hand, make sure you use your virtual hand on the Zoom, uh, Zoom tools. And if you would like to uh, unmute, if you would like to raise your hand and you're calling in on the phone, you can press star nine. Uh, just a brief reminder for those folks that are in the uh, stipend program, a reminder that in your charter, it states that you attend at least 75 of the meeting, 75% of the meeting. So that's 90 minutes in order to receive the stipend for this meeting. <clears throat> I like to post these um, uh, group agreements that you folks had uh, developed um, and, you know, just to ensure that we have a productive discussion and respectful dialogue. Um, we are, you know, asking that we all work together as a collective to help achieve the meeting goals. Um, we want to make sure that um, everyone that would like to speak has an opportunity to do so, um, that we are respectful to one another, and as much as possible that we um, are able to stick to the time allotted. We know that there's so much to talk about. So if at any point there's discussion that needs to go beyond what we've allotted, we have plans in place to be able to continue that conversation. So by no means that is closing the conversation, but as a facilitator, I might come in and suggest that um, if we are out, out of time that we might bring this topic back. And as always, we continue to um, ask that you share, the, uh, that you use the chat feature if you're not able to get in your question. Um, on time. Um, and again, we just, you know, on here, you all have stated that um, as a group, you want to make sure that you're really like addressing the problems as um, rather than any in one individual and whenever possible seeking common ground. And um, I'm going to display that one in Spanish for a few seconds. Okay, so getting into our agenda for today, we have um, several presentations prepared for you. Uh, we are going to begin off uh, hearing at uh, conversation, or we'll have some opening remarks from the Air District and the community co-chairs. Um, and then after that, we'll begin presentations at around 5.15 around the historical air quality um, in Arvin Lamont community. We will then have a uh, so those are two presentations. Uh, we have one from the Valley Air District and another one from your community co-lead, Gus. Um, and then at 5.55, more or less, we'll get started with that um, presentation, again, from the Valley Air District around the air quality monitoring options. Um, after that, we really will have a good amount of time to talk about next steps. Um, there's some announcements that we have for you regarding the upcoming meetings and, of course, the topics that are upcoming and concluding with uh, public comment. So um, uh, with com public comment in mind, I'm just displaying here the ways that you're able to participate in public comment. Um, you're able to, similar to the CSE members during the meeting, you can raise your virtual hand on Zoom if you're calling in and you want to speak. Uh, you can press star nine and let us know once we open that uh, public comment time. And you also have an opportunity to follow this meeting on Facebook and via YouTube. So with that, uh, we, are, we are ready for some opening remarks from uh, the Air District. Uh, Jessica Olson, if you wanna uh, take it over. 
Absolutely. I will be brief. I will just echo Daniela's warm welcome of everyone. My name is Jessica Olson. I am the Director of Community Strategies and Resources with the Valley Air District. And I am really excited about um, the really the next few agenda topics that we have the next several months. We've done a lot of foundation building. You've all um, done a lot of great groundwork in expressing your community sources of air quality concern, in learning um, collectively about not only sort of what air pollutants are and how they affect your health, but also where they come from. We talked a lot about the in inventory. We talked a lot about air pollution sort of 101 and talked a lot about sources. And so today we're really looking forward to talking about how we measure that air pollution in the air, because that is one of the main components of 617 implementation in your community. So uh, John Stagnero from our team is going to sort of remind us what we've talked about already, um, kind of introduce sort of historically what's been measured in the region. Uh, but Gustavo is really going to um, talk a lot more about sort of the community driven efforts that have happened recently um, and really historically, not just recently. And then we're gonna build on that and we're gonna have Chai from the Air District talk about opportunities and kind of what we can do moving forward. So we're really looking forward to it. I will pass it to Gus and Bianca um, if they have anything else to add. Um, and I just want to once again thank them for all their efforts in helping design this meeting and really have, um, hopefully, I just think a really productive uh, interactive meeting tonight. So thank you. Yeah, nothing for me. Just thank you so much, uh, everyone, for, for joining today's uh, meeting. Um, I just wanted to add that um, this is an important piece of the AB 617 and um, we we're here to support in any any way in shape or form. Um, I know that residents that have been um, fighting for this, especially because of monitoring less monitoring in the area so we're here to help in making this possible, thank you. Thank you Bianca and Gus and Jessica um, with that I. I'm just going to do a quick scan on the participant list to uh, identify anyone on the phone and uh, identify them properly. So I see someone with the name iPhone. Uh, could you unmute yourself and um, identify yourself so that we know um, we can rename you with your name? Jose Ojeda. Jose Ojeda. Okay. Thank you. Okay. With that, I I will you know transition us over. Um, I'm going to keep an eye, and I might interrupt a couple of times during the meeting to just identify anyone that is on the phone line uh, so that we can be sure we capture uh, who's here. But with that, I we're ready to transition to our next item in the agenda and, and really want to give a warm welcome to John Stagnaro uh, from the Valley Air District, who will kick us off with our first presentation on the historical air quality. Welcome, John. Right on. Thank you, Daniela. And hello, everybody. Nice to see you all again. Uh, for those of us who haven't met, my name is John Stagnero. I'm a program manager at the San Joaquin Valley Air District. And I'm here today to recap a little bit of what we've talked about before very quickly, uh, pollutants that are of concern or have been vocalized by the folks here as concerns of theirs, as well as sources of concern that might cause or emit those various air pollutants. Um, but after that, I'll talk about the historical air monitoring trends that are in and around uh, the Arvin and Lamont community and how there's been a great deal of progress made over the years in reducing air pollution in the area. But there's still work to be done, and that's why we're here. So without further ado, previously we've identified, the community's identified sources of air pollution concern, and we went through this exercise where uh, we got together in breakout groups and identified areas and locations throughout the community that uh, are of concern uh, to us where there might be sources that uh, affect our quality of life and um, pollutants that 
We want to monitor and be mindful of dust in the community and on the roads, industrial sources, heavy duty truck traffic, of course, there's a couple of big arteries moving through the community, as well as pesticides and the toxic components of pesticides, and then also a lack of green space. So this isn't a map of stationary sources. Uh, it will look like that map or very similar to it. This is a map that was produced from that exercise of identifying sources of air, of air pollution uh, concern. And then from that exercise, pollutants of concern. So all of those different activities have pollutants that they emit that are unique to them and sometimes shared among the different sources. But we wanted to also spend some time today to talk about those pollutants. And this might be a recap as well for some of you. So particulate matter 2.5 is a very small dust particles, if you will. And not necessarily dust, it could also be a constituent of wildfire smoke or uh, residential wood burning. Those are ways that particulate matter of this size, PM 2.5, can form um, directly. It can also form through secondary chemical reactions, through NOx and ammonia reacting together to form PM 2.5 or SOx and ammonia or oxides of sulfur and ammonia can react together to form PM 2.5. And I think we've all seen this graphic before where it shows the size of a human hair and then PM 10, which is like a common dust particle, and then PM 2.5 and how much smaller it is than, than the width of a human hair, just to help visualize how small that particle is. And elevated concentrations of PM 2.5 can aggravate or create severe cardiovascular conditions and include premature death, very serious. And then ozone is another pollutant that uh, is certainly a concern to all of us. It's a main component of summertime smog, and it's not formed directly like PM 2.5 is. It's actually formed from other chemicals like NOx and volatile organic compounds in the presence of heat and sunlight. And in the community here, vehicle traffic contributes over 80% uh, of the formation of NOx, which is one of those reactants that form ozone, uh, vehicles such as trucks and other on-road vehicles, as well as heavy-duty off-road vehicles like construction equipment. The other 20% of NOx formation in the community is largely due to industrial processes and consumer products like lawnmowers and paints and, and what have you. Nitrogen dioxide, uh, this is uh, a component of NOx. It belongs to or contributes to the formation of PM 2.5 as ozone, as I mentioned earlier. It's produced from burning fuel from cars, trucks, buses, off-road equipment, as well as power plants. And its health effects can include at high concentrations, irritation of airways in our respiratory systems. Sulfur dioxide belongs to a group of gases known as SOx, which contributes to the formation of particulate matter as well. Uh, it can come from wildfires, power plants, locomotives, and other vehicles, and heavy equipment that burn fuel containing sulfur. And its health effects, short-term exposures even, can harm the human respiratory system and make breathing difficult. Hydrogen sulfide, or H2S, is a flammable colorless gas. Um, if you've smelled it before, it might smell like rotten eggs. That's one way to know that it's in the area. Uh, it can come from oil and gas production, petroleum refineries, and natural gas plants, and it has health effects, including eye irritation, dizziness, headache, and exhaustion. And then there's this family of compounds, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylenes, BTEX, and they're all uh, volatile organic carbons, compounds, excuse me, again, one of the reactants that uh, can form ozone. And they come typically from motor vehicle exhaust or oil production processes, petroleum refineries, as well as petroleum storage and refueling stations. And the health effects that these can cause are throat and eye irritation, dizziness, and headaches. Okay, so there's the background. I talked a bit about the sources of concern and the pollutants of concern. And now we're gonna move into the meat of this presentation, which is to show the pollutant concentrations in and around the community of those various pollutants that I talked about and how they've been reducing over time. So here's a chart of ozone. And what you'll notice here, and you'll see throughout all of these slides that are coming, uh, coming to us is that map in the top right. The point there is to illustrate the location of the community, but then also the monitoring sites that we used to put this data together. Looking all the way back to 1989, as you can see on the 
the Y or excuse me, X axis there. Um, to go that far back in time, we had to stitch together data from multiple monitoring sites. So we had to use the data from our Arvin de Giorgio site, as well as the retired Bear Mountain site. So that's what those maps will indicate in the slides moving forward. So here we have ozone, and we can see it dropping pretty darn significantly over the past uh, many years, since 1989. And we're not quite there yet. We want to continue to do work to reduce the ozone in and around the community to meet the 1997 standard and then further down to the 2008 standard and the 2015 standard of 70 parts per billion. So right now we're hovering just under 90 parts per billion of ozone. So still a bit of work to do here. For PM 2.5, this is the uh, wildfire smoke dust, if you will, and very small dust particles also caused from uh, vehicle combustion. Um, this daily average, and it was gathered chiefly from the site in Bakersfield on California Street since 1999, this concentration has gone down from just under 100 micrograms per cubic meter down to just below the 1997 standard of 65 micrograms per cubic meter. So still work to do to get down to that 2006 standard, but we're happy to have gotten it down this far and there's still more work to do here. This next chart is the annual average of PM 2.5, also reducing uh, since 1999, also pulled from the Bakersfield site monitoring location on California Avenue. And here we wanted to highlight that in 2020, you guys see that uptick in the, in the concentration there. That's chiefly due to the unprecedented wildfire impacts that we had in California in that year. If it weren't for those wildfires, I, I like to think we'd be below that 1997 standard now. So we just wanted to highlight that as uh, something to be mindful of, but nonetheless, still work to do to get down to the 12 microgram standard for the annual average there. And here's NO2, again, part of the Knox family. And this data was gathered from the Edison site and from the retired Bear Mountain site to give us data back to 1989. Not as much of a reduction overall over the years, still a reduction though. And Notably, the concentration throughout that whole time period is below the 2010 standard of 100 parts per billion. So that's great. But if you recall, NO2 and NOx can contribute to ozone formation and to PM 2.5 formation, which we have work to do with to reduce still. So reducing NO2 or being mindful of its concentration in our community is, is impactful to those other pollutants as well. So we still want to control this, maintain this level, or reduce it ideally. Carbon monoxide, we all have carbon monoxide detectors in our homes, I hope. This is a chart dating back to 1963. Took us a few more sites to, to look at to get all that data, but the data is there. Very cool. We got data from the Bakersfield site on California Avenue, as well as two other Bakersfield sites. The yellow pin drops there are the sites operated by the San Joaquin Valley Air District, and then a retired site uh, on Chester. We had to pull those four sites together to get all the data needed to, to show this trend from 1963 to 2019. And at first, we had some challenges in the 60s and the 70s to get the carbon monoxide uh, concentration down below that 1979 standard. But since about 1981 or so, we've been below that standard and have further reduced carbon monoxide concentrations down to you know one part per million. So that's that's great. We want to be proud of that and celebrate that accomplishment and maintain that. 1,3-butadiene, uh, this, uh, this is a pollutant that can come from automobile exhaust. It's similar to benzene, which will be the next slide. And you'll notice that there's no standard line here because there is no national ambient air quality standard for 1,3-butadiene or for benzene. Um, but still, we wanted to showcase this reduction over time for us to be mindful of and, and celebrate. This data was pulled together from the Bakersfield site on California Avenue and the retired Chester site. Uh, in parts per billion, we started out at about one part per billion back in 1989 and then are currently down less than 0.2. It looks like about 0.1 or so part per billion based on the monitoring data that we have here. And here's benzene, uh, also the same two sites to grab this data, similar reductions to 1,3-butadiene over time down to about 0.5 or 0.4 parts per billion uh, at this time based on those sampling locations that you see there. Okay, so uh, the 
quick summary here is there's ongoing air quality progress that we need to continue to make, uh, in, even though there's decades long air quality trends in uh, the community's region, uh, there's still potential to reduce other pollutants and a lower attainment of carbon monoxide and NO2, continue to drive down all pollutants is uh, aim of ours and is a great, um, is a goal of the next steps that we're gonna work through with, uh, with Chai and with everyone here. Um, so this whole process is AB 617 process will assist in identifying and addressing localized air quality issues, the development and implementation of various strategies, and they will continue to improve air quality across the community. So I wanted to end my presentation with this slide here, which is a uh, screenshot of the current monitoring locations around the community uh, with respect to the community boundaries itself. And what I see here, everyone, is a great opportunity. And Chai will talk more about some of these opportunities. I know Gustavo will as well. There's opportunities now in front of the community to drop more thumbtacks, if you will, within the community, within areas of interest of the community to get more and better data uh, that we can that can help inform our community emission reduction program and target emission reductions and really get more localized um, real-time data for for this community so with that said um, i'll pass it back to you daniela thanks everyone for your kind attention thank you so much sean um i see there is a question so we um if it's okay with you we can go ahead and take that question um bianca Feel free to uh, unmute yourself. Yes, I wanted to address a little bit on the monitor that they're referring to. These monitors are, are actually, I know they're regional and it's it's something that it's picking up from the region, but they're about 45 minutes away or even 30, if, if a good drive, 30 minutes away. That is alarming because this is a community, a rural community, and yet no data from rural areas have uh, the, the district has brought it up and that that is something I did wanted to bring up for the air district if there's anything out there that has in a rural community raw data that we could re reference to because this is city city um, pollutants not a rural community pollutants and that's what's that's what we're we're having to deal with there's no monitors there's no accurate information for residents to base it on what they're what they're what they're breathing and what what's a way to address it so that that was my question and i I'll, I'll think i think what you're asking bianca is how can how can we start to address and understand the local impacts in arvin lamont not at sites that are located in bakersfield or outside that boundary and your point is is so relevant because that's exactly what we want to talk about today so Chai is going to, ex after we, we're going to talk first off about what the community has done to fill those gaps. That's what um, Gustavo's presentation will cover. And then Chai is going to talk today about air monitoring, just like you said, what are the opportunities? What can we, what kind of types of monitors can we use to understand the types of sources? And then we want to next month, and this is something we'll talk a little bit more about at the end of the meeting work with you all and literally have you all help us dis display or design what John just said, where can we start deploying that exact monitor um, type and, 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 and start measuring this air quality? Because we don't, we, you're, as you, you pointed out, that's exactly why we need this process in order to understand uh, the community air monitoring. And you're saying, for example, use the monitors that Shafter has been picking up. So the types of monitors, I think what you're getting at, maybe Bianca, we can, maybe at, during Chai's presentation, we could talk more about this. You're saying maybe let's make sure that we use the same types of monitors that a, a community like Shafter is using because it's a rural community. And we'll use that sort of as examples of what we can use. Is that what you're asking? Well, to use a, a data that is from a rural community that, um, that they have kind of the similar, addressing the similar impacts. I'm talking about mm -hmm. Shafter's monitor because they, it does, it is different from what the city picks up to what the rural communities pick mm -hmm. up. And this is, this is a community that is a rural community. We are more surrounded, we're actually more polluted than other communities because it's a, it's a you and it tends to hold back all the, all the pollutants. My, my, my question is, 
why not use that data from rural communities that we know it could be similar, not completely the same, but at least have a sense of, of the same, what they're dealing with to the communities of Arvin and Lamont. I see. So John was just displaying data that to, to like is relatively um, similar because of its location to to Arvin Lamont, but you're saying maybe we can share with you all and maybe we'll do this separately. And, and I'm looking at John, maybe we can put together a similar set of slides that we can just send out to folks as an example of what that same historical information looks like in Shafter. So people can kind of take a look at that as we learn work together to develop our own localized uh, set of monitoring strategies. That sounds good, Jessica. We can absolutely do that. Thanks, John. Thank you. We'll take these next two questions and then move to the next presentation. And, and again, we'll have some more time for you to ask John questions after Gustavo's presentation. With that, uh, Jesus Alonso, we can take your question. Sorry, I think I saw Emma's hand uh, before mine. Was that before? Okay, go ahead, Emma. Apologies. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Um, yeah, so a few questions actually. The first one being, um, going back to Bianca's question, there there isn't any data, right, that is local to Arvin Lamont Fuller Acres? Not within the community, no. The nearest site is the Arvin to Georgia site, which is just looks like a couple miles east from the eastern border of the community. Okay, okay. And then the other question was, um, how does, uh, would you say then that the uh, quality, uh, sorry, that the levels are maybe a little higher than what's being depicted in the presentation since they're so far away from the community? For sure, yeah, they, they could be, they could be. It depends on the wind direction and if the you know, surface level pollutants are going upward and diluting vertically or not. So it could be higher, yeah, it's, that's a possibility. Thank you, and then the, the last question was for the planned air monitor that I saw in the last slide. Um, when will that be implemented and what funding will be used for that monitor? Great question. And I'll have to defer perhaps to Jessica or Chai for the latest and greatest on that uh, great news. Yeah, um, Chai, do you wanna say it now or do you wanna wait till your presentation? I think we actually have a slide on that, Emma, and, um, and certainly an update as well. Okay, I just wanna make sure that it's not the fence line monitoring system that's being required from the, air, from the refinery. I know the refinery was supposed to implement a, a fence line monitoring system, I believe in August. I'm, I'm not sure if it's been implemented yet. Um, it, so it, will 617 funding be used for that specific monitor? No. Okay. Nope. So, nope. Yeah, nope. So nope. I can clarify a little bit on that one. So, so it is a part of the refinery monitoring requirements, but that does require two types of monitoring. One is fence line, which is right around the refinery. And the other is community uh, air monitoring to, to monitor the impacts of the refinery. And so that's, that's that particular one. So it is um, equipment that we're installing and we just got it electrical and everything up and running yesterday, but still working through a few kinks. So hopefully before the end of the week, it'll be up and online and live for everyone to see. So to your point, Emma, it was not part of, we will still have full, like we have, we're starting still from zero to build up from there. So that's just an addition to all of the stuff that you all will work on. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Emma. I'm going to pause for a moment. I'm getting some messages about some feedback that the um, folks are receiving. So if you are on the Spanish line or if you are anyone that's in this meeting, just please make sure that you mute yourself. If you are on the phone, you can mute yourself by pressing star six um, and you have to uh, touch the screen. Perhaps there's a symbol that allows you to mute as well. So if you are on that phone line, we're getting a lot of feedback. I'll just ask you to uh, press star six and um, if and perhaps you your phone will require you to also press the mute option in your touch phone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So with that, we'll take um, Jesus's question and then we'll, we'll move on to the next presentation. Thank you. I, I also have a, a small series of questions. Uh, first, uh, Sorry, I missed the, the, the sites for the benzene samples that were taken. Uh, I was wondering where those uh, samples areas were. 
and where are they in, in reference to um, pollution sources within the Lamont Arpin hilltop area? Sure, yeah, here you go, Jesus. I think I threw my presentation up. Can you guys see it? Yes. Okay, okay, great. Um, so this is the benzene chart that I shared and the data was pulled together from these two sites in Bakersfield. And the, okay. the blue pin is a currently active site that is uh, managed by the California Air Resources Board and the red pin here, the Chester site, that's a retired site that's no longer there. Okay. Um, and would we be able to, or yeah, I guess, is there any future plans of having benzene samples taken from uh, pollution sources in our community? Yeah, that's, that's part of this discussion. And the next steps that you know, Chai might share with you guys is the opportunity to have benzene canister samples or some other sort of benzene sampling done within the community for sure. Great, awesome. Uh, and then uh, the other question I had was uh, back on the slide of, um, of what, uh, I think it was what causes BTEX or what causes, yeah, what causes BTEX um, and some of the symptoms or, or outcomes of it. Um, I see that it says throat eye irritation, dizziness and headaches. Uh, and then the others uh, mention uh, the other other slides before that uh, mentioned different diseases. Uh, so then, I don't know that kind of that kind of looks like BTEX is not as bad as the other other contaminants. Uh, is that a correct assumption? They're all they're all pretty bad in in the health impacts of all these different compounds, it depends on a lot of different things. Concentrations, um, if it's a small concentration over a long period of time, or if it's a high concentration in a short period of time, some of these are even, even fatal. Hydrogen mm -hmm. sulfide here, it can cause death, but all of these can be pretty darn, pretty darn bad for you. So in, in, in high enough concentrations. So generally these health effects are the, at the lower doses. Um, but I, I, would I would push back and say that they're all they're all pretty harmful and should be avoided. And and okay. these are signs that you have some exposure. If you're in an area where you think that you might have, you know, act, you know, you might be breathing in any of these compounds and your throat hurts, your eyes are irritated, you feel dizzy, you feel your headache coming on, then then get out, get some fresh air and, and get away from that location because it can only get worse from there. Okay, perfect. So then like you said, all of these are dangerous. Um, in both in you know short long term, uh, I guess uh, one of the questions I hear a lot about is um, you know uh, you know which of these would be most cancer causing? Are they all cancer causing, or are there some that are more uh, carry more carcinogens with them? That's that's a great question, Jesus, and and forgive me, but that's a little out of my wheelhouse. I know that when looking at toxicity of different pollutants there's a carcinogenic or cancer causing risk factor that's calculated. And it depends on a number of factors, um, the age and uh, you know, the, uh, the age of the person exposed, the distance to the source, the concentration of the source over time. There's a lot of factors that bake into how cancerous some of these compounds are. Um, so I, unfortunately, again, it's a little out of my wheelhouse. I couldn't speak to which one of these specifically have a greater cancerous risk than others. But um, Jesus, I'm more than happy to see if I can look that up for you. I know the Office of Environmental mm -hmm. Health and Assessment, they've done a presentation to this community before, and that's kind of their domain is the health effects that all of these different pollutants might have, including their cancer risk. So I'd be more than happy to circle back to you. Jesus. And I was just going to add, I think, John, that's a great, actually looking at Emma's great question as well, asking about common symptoms in her case, our nosebleeds, common symptoms. What if we, I, I think to John's point, take these questions and ask OWIHA if we can get um, some of these questions answered so we can post them somewhere obvious, uh, maybe not only just the presentation that was given last time, but maybe something that's maybe a little more comprehensive than the very high level overview that we just gave you. Um, and then we'll also, we can also ask OWIHA to attend a future meeting so we can have maybe some of those detailed questions answered as well. That would be awesome, thank you. Uh, and then my my last question is, um, if we can look back at the eight hour chart, uh, I think it was uh, for particulate matter, um, the or uh, any any of the eight hour ones. Uh, it sounded like uh, we used to because of how far back uh, we went that we used two sources: the Bear Mountain and the De Giorgio. Um, 
uh, was at what point in time did we switch from uh, having a monitor at Bear Mountain and, and switched it over to Dead Georgia? Great question, Jesus. I'm sorry to say I don't recall specifically when that, that cutoff took place, but I do have the data behind this chart and I could find out for you pretty, pretty quickly. And I know okay. we have that, that is a CARB monitor. So I think what we can do as well, Jesus, is we can um, send, put maybe some information in the chat. We did have some um, great feedback from our CARB liaison, Michelle, about that very question. And we can um, add that information so that you can all see it in the chat and it will be translated as well. So we can drop some of that in. Yeah, just give me a second. I'll pull it up and put it in there for you. Thanks, Michelle. I appreciate it. No problem. Okay, perfect. Yeah, because what comes to mind is uh, if moving the monitor further away from the community had some impact on, uh, you know, levels of detection. Um, that's one of the things I think would be important to know. And that's everything. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Jesus. Thank you all for your questions and thank you, John, for your presentation. With that, we're ready to move to Gustavo's presentation and John, uh, we'll send any other questions your way as, as we go into our next Q&A session. Um, well, Gustavo Aguirre from the Central California Environmental Justice Network is gonna uh, have a presentation. And so with that, we welcome you, Gustavo, um, and you may begin uh, sharing your screen with your slides. Thanks. Daniela, before we proceed, um, I, we are still hearing feedback on one okay. of the phones in the Spanish line. So if the person who is on the AT&T call line can please push the uh, microphone button, they don't need to push star six or anything, just their little microphone button, that would greatly help. So we are not hearing the English in the background. Thank you, Marisela. Please do let us know if it continues and we'll pause again. Cool. How's it going, everyone? When I said this, uh, does can everyone see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. If you want to hit the uh, full view. Yeah. One second. Cool. Perfect. So, thank everyone. Um, uh, I'll try to make it as as brief as possible without talking too fast uh, for the interpreter. Uh, but really, what today's presentation is is uh, an introduction to. Uh, community air monitoring in South Kern, right? And how uh, CCJN, uh, who I work with, uh, uh, has uh, enabled and participated with the residents to do participatory research uh, in this in these communities, right? Uh, we saw that as far as regulatory monitors, um, there was a lack of, and so we'll talk a little bit about um, some of that here today. Uh, just. A quick agenda, we'll talk about, just briefly introduce our organization, uh, Central California Environmental Justice Network. For those that don't know us, um, we'll talk about a, a little bit about the community air monitoring networks, how to plan them, uh, a little bit about the sensory uh, technology and the monitors using them, and then just how to maintain them, right, and how to use them correctly. Um, and again, uh, Central California Environmental Justice Network, really our vision of our organization is to end environmental racism, achieve economic justice and health equity through a sustainable regional approach, right? So it's working not just in silos, but throughout this region um, uh, to support that, right? And, and um, we have obviously our mission statement and then uh, you know, some of our major programs that we have here are our Ivan reporting platforms in Fresno, Kern, and in Tulare County. Now, um, a community science project. Uh, we work obviously uh, geographically in the Central Valley. So pesticide and oil and gas is, is a lot of the work that we do. And then we uh, have the pleasure and privilege to work with youth and education programs. And we even have partners uh, that are part of the CSC that we've worked with uh, for a while who um, you know, really are the leaders in the youth movement. Uh, so shout out to them. Uh, here, what we have here are three different images at the very top, right? And I'll talk about each one of those images uh, as we introduce community air monitoring, right? Um, the very first image was an image that was created in 2018 by a youth from Fresno. Uh, and the assignment was draw your version of what environmental justice is to you, what, what, how do you see environmental justice, right? And the background of this youth was that, um, you know, they come from a, a long a history of farm working family members, right? And you see here just an evolution of, from the very far bottom far 
uh, to the bottom right, the evolution of a farm worker, right? And in this case, the, his family always lived next to a factory. And so this is what he, he he saw as an environmental justice, right? So this is working with youth, what you're working with youth and developing art. This is how they communicate what they see, right? The middle image is climate justice is social justice, right? It's just an intersection of how really all the entanglement of social justice and climate justice, how they intertwine together, right? How economic justice, racial justice, wi uh, uh, women's justice, labor, labor uh, wildfires, uh, climate change, they all interact with each other, right? And so we work together with other organizations that interact in the space uh, to try to really develop, you know, very meaningful engagement for residents. And the very last image is just uh, uh, kind of probably outdated uh, version of an EPA organizational chart, right? So when with the reason why we have reporting platforms and re reporting networks is because this is the spider web that exists of how to get any, to, how to talk to government, right? Uh, when you make a, 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 a report on pollution and you call the water district, they refer you, you know, to a different agency. So it's just a visual of how government works and how we could alleviate residents uh, in navigating the system, right? Uh, and how to start a community air monitoring network is just using the lens of community science, right? Uh, uh, there's a spectrum of community science and we'll talk about it here. Uh, we use ground truthing technology uh, uh, efforts uh, with community organizing. Uh, and then we use regulatory da databases that already exist, you know, Cal Envir Screen, uh, the CARB uh, uh, Pollution Mapping Toolkit, uh, you know, the different DTSC and uh, pesticide regulation mapping toolkits that exist, both at the government level, but also at the research level, right? And then we use all this information, you know, to really create advocacy efforts. So planning part of, you know, uh, and I'm not going to read it word for word, but planning an environment, uh, kind of a community air monitoring network really just takes a community, right? It, it, it takes working in the community. Uh, thankfully for us, we have worked with pioneers, like people that have really led this fight in, in community air monitoring, right? Comité Civico del Valle, West Oakland's uh, indicator project, Long Beach Port Communities out, uh, you know, doing community air monitoring on PM 2.5, ozone, gases. And so we've learned, we, we didn't do this by ourselves. We learned from people that have been pioneering this work from the very beginning here in California. Um, and we really take that work down to the community level, down to the neighborhood level, right? Take the information that we know from, from collectively from government information and using that uh, and then seeing what is missing in this community, right? And so part of the goal is to go into these communities where there is little or no air monitoring and start doing community advocacy, right? Through collecting pollution logs, which you know a lot of the comités here have done, participating in walking audits, doing mapping uh, exercises using drones, balloon kit maps, walking the streets, you know. So it, it, it takes a lot of effort, right? Um, and this this visual is a visual that we use. It, it might be a little bit outdated, but is it and it might not be. It might be accurate uh, that we used to determine where we need to put community air monitoring and where we need to focus our energy. Right, uh, the images that you see. There's four images here, and all of them are centered around PM two point five. Right, and the needs uh, of air monitoring here in the San Joaquin Valley. Right, the very first image to the top left that you see is a screen grab from the Valley Air District's website. And each one of those uh, numbers represents an air monitor that is in this region, right? Um, going over to the next, uh, the next map, like this heat map from red to green, you see what are like historically where the pollution in this in this case air pollution where is the highest air pollution of PM two point five concentrated in this valley right and you see that those blue boxes that you see in those first two top images there's very little activity when it comes to air monitoring but a lot of activity when it comes to concentration of PM two point five right and so from that you know we did we we look at what tools already exist or what databases already exist. And so we look at the bottom left image that has like the purple and pink and green dots. Those, each one of those is a, a, a facility that is permitted uh, to, to operate and cause pollution, right? And then the last image that you see here, which is a, a map, 
uh, you see those little stars are where the maps actually are, right? Where, where I'm sorry, where the monitors actually are, right? And so you, you see a disproportion of where there's a concentration of sources of pollution and where community or where uh, air monitors are actually uh, uh, stable, right? So community air monitoring uh, uh, networks, right? It, it really, it starts off with a question, right? Using the spectrum of community science, we, we take reports, uh, we notice that there's a trend of reports. We go out and do these grab samples, which is this little bucket that you see here with our logo. Uh, this grab sample is used to capture H2S or, or benzene or gases that come from particularly like dairies or oil and gas facilities, right? This bottom picture, there's a training uh, of us using a PM 2.5 monitor, right? Um, and, a, a, and showcasing this to the residents. And then this last picture is a more advanced uh, sensory technology that we've used uh, and, and currently are using uh, that uses very you know, technical uh, uh, sensory technology uh, and sensors that captivate or capture a large range of pollutants, right? Uh, ozone, PM 2.5, uh, total gases, right? It doesn't speciate it like the bucket does, but it does tell you there's there's gases out there. And so when we go out to the community, right? In, in theory, that what we do is, you know, we start by raising a question, right? Uh, then we go into identifying the sources of pollution by doing ground truthing exercises, right? Walking the community, looking at maps, looking at data toolkits. Uh, then we get to know the sources of pollution, right, and, and why they might be if, why they might be bad to public health, right. Uh, we look at what they're permitted to pollute. Uh, then we introduce them into the Ivan reporting platform. How can they visualize this, report this, and then track this information, right? And through the use of walking tours, pollution logs, uh, reports uh, to the air district, and then getting reports back from the air district by obtaining the data, then we use that information to either say, okay, then we're okay, or actually there's an issue and a problem here and we need to address it, right? Uh, and so this is just a, a very high over level view of what how we use uh, community air monitoring, right? Quickly, some of the some of the sensors. This so this is actually the very first top one. Is uh, all those monitors that you see there are some of our monitors from back in the days that we developed with the University of Colorado to do uh, total methane, right? So to just to say there's this much gas in the air, right? And we co-calibrated those with the state of California uh, Air Resources Board. So we're sitting on top of their trailer, right? We also do educational uh, uh, stuff on the air monitoring tools that we use uh, and the data that we collect. And this very bottom picture is actually a picture of Arvin, California. And in the very back, you see some oil and gas derricks, right? And so this is this little tower that we have there. That's an air sensor uh, monitor that we have. Um, and this just talks about, you know, why it's important, you know, uh, the pros of this is that we are able to collect information and give it to regulatory agencies. The cons is that this information and the, and the, and the technology that we're using is not the same uh, thing that the government is, are using, right? So they're using different regulatory methodologies and we're using very advanced quality insurance technology and very advanced technology. Uh, but again, we're not the government, right? So we're using this as an effort. So one of the cons is that we're not able to bring data and, and write a violation against uh, polluter, right? Uh, very quickly, arvinairquality.com was a project that we had. It was a very intensive, a very purposeful project where we uh, put down seven air, seven multi-sensory monitors with, that detected different things in the community. From oil and gas, uh, we we with that project we captured uh, pipeline uh, leaks in the community. Obviously, agriculture is a huge uh, source of, of uh, concern in this community. So we captured PM two point five and PM ten, and then obviously vehicle pollution, right? Uh, diesel and passenger pollution, uh, and this is a, a picture of where these monitors were at. Very quickly from that from that project, something that we captured um, was. Sorry, something that we captured was the, the fact that, oh God, what's going on here? Sorry. Um, so what you see here are screen grabs of this project, right? Arvin Air Quality uh, Project, right? Where we have these multiple sensors. 
the blue, what you see in the very first graph is the state value, right? What the state is capturing, we're using their data and integrating it into our modules and then putting our information on there, right? And then you see the red is B2, is uh, BTO2, which is one of the locations of the, of the monitors, right? And, and so you see that besides one day or one period of the day, our information was relatively the same with the state, right? And so we calibrated this information like every six months, right? And so aside from some spikes, the information went pretty good, right? Again, with NO2, uh, we compared state levels against our calibration, our monitors, right? So you see here two different depictions of information from the state and what our monitors were capturing, right? And what was very interesting from this is that we use this information to put monitors even closer to where the sources of pollution were and where frontline communities were living. In some cases, right across the street, this is one example. The red you see at the very bottom is a monitor that's in Arvin High School. The green is a monitor that is in the community in, in the road of Di Georgia. And then the blue is uh, a monitor that was in the street of Shane Court. Shane Court was fence line to an oil and gas producer. And this is just VOC. So this is uh, you know volatile organic compounds. And it's not speciated, but it's just it's a total VOC, right? And so here we see a clear depiction that can people or, and places that are next to oil and gas facilities and just like in this picture here are more have a greater probability of being exposed to VOCs right and so this is some of the information that we captured of course none of this could have been possible without the amazing support of other community members from Arvin Lamont and beyond right because we work with Los Hills Shafter and then in other uh, San Joaquin Valley communities right and this is just a collective picture of a lot of uh, the folks that do uh, and actively uh, do uh, participatory research with us um, here in the San Joaquin Valley. And so we're very excited, right, that we've done a lot of research at the community level. And now we have the government that will come down and verify, right, not that we need to be validated by the work that we did, but verify, double down, ground truth, what we have been capturing for, for many, many years, right? And so we're very thankful for that. Um, and that concludes my, uh, my presentation. Thank you so much, Gustavo, uh, for all that great work and for your presentation on it. Um, we'd, I'd like to invite any of the community members to um, raise their hand at this time or unmute themselves if they uh, would like to ask a question to our um, to Gustavo. Um, and you, if you do have remaining questions uh, for John, the first presentation, you can also you know, ask those questions now. It was a lot of information, I'm sorry. But again, this is just a very high level overview of like AB 617 was not an accident in South Korea, right? There has been a lot of legwork that has happened that has led to this point. And now these residents that are here today, a lot of these residents that are here today actually were the ones that drove these projects, right? And so this is just a morphing of all the groundwork that they've laid uh, to this day, right? Absolutely, Gustavo. Thanks for your leadership. Um, so community members, this is your time. If you do have some questions, um, we got a comment from Valeria Navarro saying, uh, great job. Um, and we do have, uh, again, some time for your questions or comments. So I'd like to just invite um, community members to raise their hand or unmute themselves if they would like to to ask or share some, some thoughts. Yeah, this is El Partida, but I, I don't know how to raise the, the, the arm. Hi, what was your name one more time? Sal Partida. So, okay, thank you so much, go ahead. Uh, this, uh, this is a, a good compliment for Gustavo. Gustavo, you did a good job. Uh, but I didn't see any of the data that we collected uh, over and above uh, Bear Mountain Boulevard right on top of my building. Yeah, so we have, we have you know, fortunately and unfortunately years and years of data. Uh, and so this was just talking about the methodology or like the approach 
of how community science data has happened in South Carolina. But yeah, I mean, we we have reports, we've generated a lot of data. Um, and so Sa Salvador, if you, if you want this information, I could definitely provide it to you for sure, yeah. Um, it, it, at the location that he's referring, we had a stationary um, multi-sensory uh, air, air monitor that picked up total VOCs, PM 2.5, uh, PM 10, uh, and then uh, some NO2, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so we have, like I said, we have a chart of, of, of like uh, the entire time that it was there when it was operational. So I'll be happy to share that with you for sure. Thank you. Great, thank you. And we have one question from Minerva Contreras. Uh, she's wondering uh, when your organization was funded, uh, founded. Yeah, our, our organization was founded about 21 years ago uh, as a volunteer organization only. Um, and in 2013, I'm sorry, 2012, uh, we, uh, the organization hired the very first employee. Um, and in 2013, we started working in Kern County. So uh, we, we developed uh, in the San Joaquin Valley by other organizations such as CVAC, which some of their members are here, the Center for Race, Poverty, and the Environment, which some of their members are here. And we started really uh, at, the, at the beginning of the environmental justice movement here in California with toxics and uh, kind of like the private prison industry. And since then have really like tried in the trajectory of environmental justice have uh, followed that right now doing a lot of pesticide, uh, oil and gas and organizing work. Yeah, we also have a website, ccjn.com or .org. So I, I can link it and, and we have like a history of, of our information and a lot of the projects that we've done that have been highlighted uh, over the long time. Uh, and I don't have, um, there's also a, a, a Bakersfield, California article that's in my wall here from uh, June 27, uh, 2018. And I'm going to show you guys. And this is... <laughs> Worst air anywhere, right? And this is a monitor that actually is in front of uh, one of the CBA members' house. And it says, Arvin takes matters into its own hands, right? And so since then, uh, and, and before that, there's been a lot of activity uh, uh, with community members empowering themselves and, and generating this data and uh, really kind of uh, making it their own. And that's probably the most exciting piece about uh, participatory research for sure. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Gus. I saw, um, so I will have Joanna go and then I had another person raise her hand and I'll come back to them in case they did want to share something. Joanna, uh, go ahead. Este, yo también quería ver si me, uh, yo también tengo un monitor de aire en mi casa y quería ver si me podían mandar datos de cómo salió el aire. Ya, ya lo tengo tiempecito también, igual que don Salvador. Sí, sí, cómo no. Este, gracias, Joanna. Este, sí, este, me comunico con César, que es la persona que hace, es, oh, I'm sorry. I will communicate with César, who is the person who holds Just, our... just one second. Just one second, okay. Gus. Let's, let, okay. let us go ahead and interpret that, and then you can answer. Yes, yes. Um, so I also have a air monitor, and I wanted to see if you could send data of what came out, just like uh, Don Salvador has one as well. Yes, thank you. So we, yeah, we have, uh, we will capture that data and uh, send it over to Joanna for sure. Thank you. Esto. Gracias, Joanna. We have Maria and Roberto Garcia. You can unmute yourself and go ahead. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, estoy un poquito, estoy un poquito ronca, eh. Este, solamente quiero decirle a, a, a Gustavito que muchas gracias por todo el trabajo que han hecho de, el monitoreo de, del aire, porque a base de eso nos hemos estado dando cuenta de toda la contaminación que tenemos aquí en Arvin y Lamón y, y todos nuestros alrededores. Y por eso estamos aquí, estamos aquí en este programa de las 617 para, para este, empezar a trabajar, a que, a que hagan algo, porque... Sabemos con todo el trabajo que han hecho con los monitores, toda la contaminación que hay aquí. Entonces ahora lo que ya queremos es eh, empezar a trabajar y que, y que nos quiten toda esta contaminación que hay. Entonces, pues muchas gracias a Gustavo y a todos los que han trabajado en, en todo esto. 
eh, me cuento entre ellos, ¿verdad? Que hemos estado trabajando en todo eso y, y pues a, a seguir adelante y, y pues gracias, gracias por todo esto que está pasando. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm a bit sick, sorry, but I just wanted to say thank you so much to Gustavito for all the hard work that he's doing and the air monitoring because because of that work, we now know what contaminants are around. And that's why we're here in the 617 because we know what's going on and now we want to work to remove all this contamination. So thank you so much, Gustavo, and all of those who have worked in this. Yeah, no, just it's been my pleasure for sure. So it's just providing a platform for residents. Thank you so much uh, to all the community members for your comments and um, Gustavo for your presentation. I, I don't see any other hands raised or questions at this time. So um, I'll go ahead and move us uh, along. To, oh, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Gustavo, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Gustavo Senior, I'm on my phone and uh, not very familiar with um, how to raise my hand. But my question is, um, uh, on the the presentation on the uh, it is include the on the ag operation agriculture operations is it included the the pesticide uh, pollution also or that's something different are you asking about the presentation that john just gave about the historical air monitoring Yes, or or any other way how the pesticide pollution is, is measured, uh, how it is affecting our communities. Right. So we uh, aren't, we don't measure pesticides. Uh, that's been something historically that's been done by the Department of Pesticide Regulation. And so that is something um, much to some of the other follow up. We can go back and work with DPR to see historically what, if any, pesticide monitoring specifically within the community has been done. I'll work with Gustavo and Bianca um, to make sure we follow up on that and get that information um, to this community uh, so that we can have that answer for you, Gustavo. Yeah, thank you, because I think pesticides uh, pollution is uh, very important to, to be included here. Uh, because you know the communities are surrounded by agriculture operations, and and it's not just you know the machines that are used by uh, ag operations, but also the all the pesticides that are being applied. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank and then you. from from our end, uh, we uh, in our community project we've never done pesticide monitoring, but we have done monitoring around PM two point five and ten that is a lot of the, the dust that comes out of those fields. But uh, historically, when we research pesticide air monitoring has been either qu quite expensive or, or very, very uh, methodological, right? Where you need to work with a laboratory. Um, and so DPR, the Department of Pesticide Regulation, I believe would be the one that, that hopefully would have that. And I think as a formal request, uh, I'm requesting if it hasn't uh, been requested that DPR uh, do, you know, uh, some kind of historical, if there is any data of air monitoring, pesticide air monitoring that has been done in this uh, South Kern region, please. Thank you. Um, so I see one, one more hand raised. And before I go to Mario, I'm gonna read the comment that came in from Wendy Lozano uh, a moment ago. Uh, it says, I live close to a refinery on Panama Lane, and I concur with uh, Dolores Martinez. I had to work for a month in Arvin in the open air and burning in the eyes is the worst. Irritation in the throat and the air pollution is horrible. Uh, so your comment is noted. Thank you, Wendy. And um, I will turn it over to Mario before we move on to our next presentation, since I see uh, their hand raised. Mario, uh, you can uh, unmute yourself and share your comment. Um, yeah, I, will, I just wanna say that uh, uh, Gustavo Sr., I agree what he's saying, that we do need monitors for pesticides. I really agree on that because uh, we have a lot of things going on around here with pesticides. I just wanna say, I agree with what he says. And también el junior. 
<laughs> Thank good. you. You did a really good job. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mara. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This has been uh, very uh, helpful for you to share your uh, questions and, and just how you see things in your community. With that, I'm going to transition us over to our next presentation um, on air quality monitoring and would like to welcome Chai Tao from the Valley Air District. There were a few questions in the chat for that you commented. So in your presentation, I'll, I'll remind us of those questions at the end. Um, but very, I want to give uh, Chai a, a warm welcome. Well, thank you, Dan Daniela, and good evening, everyone. Um, it's great to see you all and really great to hear all that dialogue. Um, everybody's very excited about the uh, various types of air monitoring. So. I feel like we're ready to get this thing moving. So, but I know it's going to be a lot of work and we're definitely going to need more time to discuss this. So let me first uh, share my screen here. Uh, let's see. All right. So can everybody see this? Yes. So just to kind of tie everything together. Um, so John talked about the various pollutants of concern and some of the trends. And then Gustavo did a really great job on, on some of the efforts that's already been done and which gives us some general ideas of you know things that we're concerned about where we're concerned in those areas and we're definitely that's going to help us in our next upcoming future meetings to and identify now um, you know what type of options are available to us what tools do we have um, and what they're capable of so i'm just going to give a really brief overview of the various types of tools that we have um, and i think that's going to be um, helpful as we move into our next discussions on on how which ones we want to deploy, where we want to deploy. So the first one here is, you know, we, we've been talking about particular PM 2.5. This is a real-time PM 2.5 uh, monitor. And uh, the, the difference between this and some of the other monitors uh, that's used or, or otherwise known as low-cost sensors is these are much more expensive and they require uh, continual maintenance. Uh, and they, you, you have to calibrate them before you use them. And every now and then you have to recalibrate them again to make sure that, that everything is, is operating as it should and, and that the, the numbers that we're getting are accurate and true. And so that's the one difference between these and some of the lower cost sensors that anybody can purchase a couple hundred dollars and just install them in. Although the low cost sensors do have their, their uses and they're really great to just have a bunch of them all over the place. They, show us where the trends are and have been really useful for that. But if we really wanna know accurately what the emissions are, what levels, what the levels are, then these are the, uh, the instruments that should be used. And these are, the, these are regulatory grade equipment. Um, so this, is, this, this unit here just provides PM 2.5 reading, uh, real-time reading for that. Um, and then we also have, in terms of PM 2.5, uh, we have, this piece of equipment right here. And what this does is that it collects samples. And so it collects the 24 hour samples for it. And, and once it gets collected, we send these off to the laboratory and then they take a look at all the PM25 and they identify all the different components in there. And that can help us eventually find out where the potential sources of pollution could be coming from. But again, this collects it and then we have to send it to the lab and wait until we get the results. And we also do that. There's also that for VOC as well too. So this, this canister here collects, uh, collects the samples for 24 hours and then we send that off to the laboratory and they do the analysis and they uh, identify all the various um, compounds within the VOC uh, in the air. And it's capable of isolating um, 86 different VOCs from each air sample. Then now, um, now we go to the uh, larger units. And these are really just a, a, an enclosure. So like, for example, this one is a compact multi-pollutant air monitoring system. And what, as you can see with the picture here, it's, it's a box with, with, uh, with cooling in there and with electrical uh, power, and then we can put multiple types of analyzers uh, for various types of compounds uh, like PM 2.5, black carbon, BTEX and total VOC, SO2, H2S, NO2, ozone. So they have various um, uh, units. Of, there are various units that we can put in there to do those measurements. And typically what we do is we put this on a trailer and then we can place it on site. 
Now we usually combine this with the uh, unit that I talked about earlier, which is the PM for PM25. So this gives us more ability to, to put more uh, analyzers for more types of pollutants here, and then also have the PM25 from this, um, this unit here. And another uh, platform that we use is the air monitoring trailer. And this is uh, usually combined with the um, VOC uh, speciation and the PM25 speciation uh, in here. Uh, and then it just, we have a lot of room for multiple piece, types of equipment that we can install into here. And this measures, again, the PM25, black carbon, BTEX, SO2, H2S, NO2, and ozone. And we can add additional in there if needed of, of any other type of pollutants. And in addition to those, we also have an air monitoring van, and it also has the capability of measuring all the similar pollutants. And one of the main uses of this one is really to have very quick deployment. So let's say if within the community, um, somebody identifies that, oh, you know, in this area over here, we're noticing something that, that um, may be toxic with some, some type of pollution that we're concerned with, what we can do is we can drive the van over there and um, have it parked there for a while and take the samples and measurements. Or we can even, if there's any good locations, we can park it there, plug it in and have it run for a few days to, um, to capture um, and measure all the various types of pollutants. And so just a really brief summary, as you can see here, um, as far as real-time reporting of the various types of uh, platforms that we have, um, and as far as a regulatory grade. So all the ones that I've been talking about are all regulatory grade. Uh, you know, they all require uh, continued maintenance. They all require calibrations to make sure that we have uh, the most accurate and precise uh, readings from. Um, and then these are just a kind of a breakdown of what, what it's capable of doing, uh, measuring PM25 to NOx to VOC to diesel particulates and other toxics. And then uh, Jess will jump in onto some of the next steps here. Thanks, Chai. Um, yeah, so really what we wanted to do today and something that we're working with the co-leads on for our next meeting is of course today was to introduce, so remind folks kind of what we're talking about when we talk about pollution, remind folks what's been done in the community, which Emma really you know, pointed out, not, not much specifically in the community, right? We're talking a lot about kind of regional stuff but not a lot's been done specifically in the community on the regulatory grade type work, um, type of monitoring. Um, a lot's been done on the community level though, we just found out from, uh, from a lot of the work that you have all been doing uh, with Gustavo's project that he mentioned. And so taking a look at these options and these um, set of air monitoring tools that Chai spoke about, before the next meeting, we would love it if everyone kind of took all of this, took this really home to kind of understand what we're talking about. And then before the next meeting, we also want to send out, like we always do the week before, some materials that sort of describe what the exercise is that we want to do at the next meeting. And then really use that next meeting to say, you know, we think that based on kind of all of the sources of concern you've already described, if we um, you know, wanna deploy six PM 2.5 monitors and a couple of those trailers and those compact systems that Chai mentioned, where do you all want to place those? What makes the most sense to this group? Um, maybe working in small groups to really get a good set of recommendations that we can then build on. So that's really the goal of today is to introduce these concepts to you, get you thinking a little bit about it, and then be really armed with a lot of great information for the next meeting. And I'll kick it to Daniela for any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chai, for your presentation and, and Jessica for those next steps. We have several questions. Um, one, just to clarify on the, on the language, there was a question here that came in. What does a regulatory grade mean? Yeah, that's a great question. Maybe uh, um, I'll kick it to Chai if I miss something, but I keep saying regulatory, we keep saying that because that's the world we live in, but in reality, it's it's what Chai mentioned. Things are calibrated. Things are regularly able to be checked against like a known standard, meaning if I, um, for example, uh, purple air, as Chai mentioned, is really, really great. And we love the concept that it's 
accessible to a lot of folks. It's obviously much cheaper than. Um, I'm yeah. sorry to stop. Can we hold on? There's someone in the at and line with their audio on. And okay. We can hear anything at all. Give me a second. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so, but a purple air monitor, it just comes out of the box and then you can't ever correct the monitor or help the monitor make sure that it's, that it's right. So sometimes when you're working with um, even like a clock, for example, on, you know, might eventually run slow if you don't maintain it or don't regularly change out the battery, for instance, or various other little things. Well, you can imagine these monitors are very complex. And so regular maintenance means that they're able and they're, they're similar to what we normally use in our regulatory network. So that's why we keep using the word regulatory grade, but it essentially means that the data is very close, as close as possible to actually what's happening which isn't necessarily always the case with maybe air quality sensors. Thank you. I'll go to the folks that have their hand raised and then come back to the chat for some more questions from there. So uh, Bianca, you can go ahead and um, unmute yourself. Yes, I had a question in regards to the mobile monitoring. Um, I know that we had in other communities had an issue about monitoring do, being done only around business hours, which it would be eight to five. I was wondering, is the air district going to do any of those changes to make it after hours to pick up more, um, more emissions? Um, because we know that a lot of the industry like to practice their, their practice in the evening. So I was wondering, is the air district open to the idea of doing it after hours? Yes, uh, most definitely, Bianca. And we've we've learned a lot from um, our monitoring at Fresno and, and our van monitoring in, Sh in Shafter as well. And uh, even in Shafter, I know there was some concern with that, and we did uh, move them to later monitoring. But really, the ideal is is to to find a location and to monitor there for for like a few days, and not just to drive over there and and monitor for two hours or three hours. Uh, that's really not going to capture it, and so. Um, what we're trying to do, I think, I mean, with a van is find a location where we can safely park it and have um, electrical power there, and we can monitor it for, for a few days. And that's, that's, that's an example, for example, like what we're doing in, in Stockton. You know, we, we find it at a location, and we just park there for a while. Um, but definitely, uh, as far as doing it a little bit later, um, we, are, uh, we are doing that as well. Great. Thank you. Um, Mario, you can share next. Yeah, I, I'm still trying to figure out uh, how far the monitors, you know, man, what's that word? How far they, the range of it to read the, the, the air? What is so the range? Is it a mile, two miles, three miles, four miles? Yeah, so um, one, way to th one way to think of it is that it's not really, it's not, it's not like a camera where you're looking out to, to find something. It's whatever it detects at that specific location. So it's, it's basically sucking the air in and then analyzing that air. So, so what that's, so it's just getting the air at where it's located. Um, so in terms of the distance, it's, it's more of, how far does that pollutant actually travel? So let's say you have a refinery a mile away, is that really reaching that location? So in this particular case, for example, we have, uh, we have a community air monitor for refinery at um, Mountain View uh, Middle School. And so uh, the idea on there is how far does the pollutant, if there's any pollution that's traveling from the refinery that's reaching it. Um, so it's, yeah, it's not, capable to zoom in and farther out, but it's really- that's, uh, that's all the monitors? Every each and monitor is like that? Yeah, and right. so if I can maybe add just kind of for context, really what we do with air monitoring is we're trying to understand what you are breathing. So typically what we do is we tend to, as a community, uh, look to like deploy monitors, say at like a school, or near where a lot of residents live because it's going to give us the best picture of the air that those people are breathing. 
So the further, uh, it's not really about matter of the distance. That's actually, Chai mentioned earlier, one of our capabilities is to understand the types of pollution. He called it speciation, and you might hear us use that term a lot. It's where we not only just look at how much is happening, but what type of, say, PM 2.5, or VOC is happening. So that's where we'll start to understand exactly what's causing the pollution. So it can, to Chai's point, um, it can be something that's traveling, maybe it's wildfire smoke that's traveling thousands of miles. There, I mean, all of that, if it's impacting that say neighborhood or that community or that high school will be detected um, on that monitor. Anything that's impacted is being taken in, if that makes sense. <laughs> Uh, um, well, right now, that's what I've got right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. With that, we can go to Gustavo. Yeah, um, just a comment. I think you mentioned that uh, you're going to send some materials for next meeting for us to review. And if I understood correctly, it's, uh, you know, maybe the exercise that we want to do or you want to do with us is uh, maybe, you know, recommending which uh, monitors or how many monitors will be placed on specific areas. But uh, it's uh, just talking for myself, not knowing much about which monitor is uh, maybe best for which mm -hmm. location. Uh, will the information that you will send uh, have some basic uh, information mm -hmm. for each monitor that yes. like what kind of uh, pollution each monitor capture and um, which uh, maybe just, uh, you know, I don't know what may be useful, but, you know, what are the polluting sources mm -hmm. that will match uh, which monitor? I think uh, yeah. as having that basic information will help us, you know, uh, participate in a better way. Yeah. Gustavo, I think you're participating on your phone, so I don't know if you caught all of the presentation, but actually that, that information is exactly what Chai just went over. And then at the very end of the presentation is that quick summary. That's exactly what you mentioned. So the quick summary is more of the pollutants, but actually each slide is the exact type of monitor we're proposing. And it describes maybe the type of source. So, or it kind of looks at the types of sources. So for example, if we're talking about PM 2.5, you know, we're talking and, and John Stegner actually went over kind of the sources that contribute. But I think what we'll do, Gustavo, is so that it is clear, we'll just make sure that ahead of the next meeting, folks know exactly which pieces to look at and what the intent is. So yes, to your point, we'll talk about the air pollutant um, monitors, what they types of sources they monitor. Also, we're hoping that the next exercise is really you telling us where you want to monitor and for what types of sources. That way you don't have to be the experts in the monitoring equipment. And then based on all of the feedback in every, in every group, and we're gonna do it hopefully in a, in a fun way where we're working with the co-leads to make it very visual. And then based on that feedback, we are going to then say, okay, well, everyone was really interested in the dust on Main Street in Lamont. Um, and they think that it's, you know, maybe coming from, from uh, maybe trucks driving. And so we think a PM monitor kind of next to Main Street, maybe at the new high school, like those are the sorts of things we would work on together. So we don't expect everyone to be um, an, an expert, although we will still send out all of that information you just requested, Gustavo. Yeah, thank you. And just a follow up question uh, for uh, maybe... Uh, potential sites for the monitors. Uh, are you going to also, or are we going to review the the feedback that we provided uh, in prior meetings on polluting sources or how we are going to uh, yeah. use that data? Absolutely. So actually we want to use that exact map. Um, and the thought is maybe we use that same map we did all of the pollutant source mapping. 
and then build on that with different pins that are more recommendations from each of the small groups. So it would actually be a very similar exercise where we were all in those small groups. But this time we're talking more about locations and we're actually gonna make it easy, hopefully, by dividing up the whole community in sort of sections so that you can think section by section so it's not so overwhelming. Um, and so, yes, we're hoping to build upon, we definitely wanna use the information you have already worked on together. Yeah, and I, uh, uh, I think it's a recommendation, if possible, maybe to identify, you know, the the uh, residents and, you know, the committee members, maybe to be, you know, uh, part of uh, in the small groups, like, for example, you know, people living in uh, near the refinery, you know, maybe identify, you know, the, the participants that residents that are from that area because they know that area or, you know, residents in Arvin talking about, you know, the trucks going through their community. Mm -hmm. So maybe yes, uh, ensuring that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. residents from those areas are there to speak for themselves, you know, in terms of uh, mm -hmm. what they see on daily basis. I love that. We're going to work very closely with our co-leads. So I'll, I'm seeing the facilitators took those notes and I'll, I'll work with Bianca and Gustavo on, uh, that's a great suggestion. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, you can uh, feel free to unmute yourself at this time and share your comment or question. No problem. So I, for some reason, I accidentally chose Spanish. My my apologies there. So uh, quick question for the air district or comment regarding particulate matter and monitoring. So I, I think it's important to note that it does matter where the monitor is located for particulate matter and that particulate matter is a local issue and it can come down right next to you from the source or travel some miles away. It depends on the weather that day. So it is important to have a monitor as close to you as possible, especially for PM 2.5, so that you're aware of what the pollution is in your area, mm -hmm. at your neighborhood or at your school that day. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what the community air monitoring projects are all about. We certainly concede that they are not regulatory monitors. However, uh, working with the air district on those, we are definitely, at least with the sjbair.com project and Gustavo's project, we are working to make sure that they are as accurate as possible and the air district has ac access to that. And so I, I think a, a plan would be uh, Arvin Lamont deserves some mobile monitoring systems similar to what Fresno and Stockton had, where they're in a van that could be mobilized quickly should a resident have a monitor and see uh, a very high reading and be concerned. So I, I think that's one thing we still don't have is that communication where a resident could speak to somebody directly at the air district and, and have that issue dealt with quickly. So that's certainly something to work on, though. And I know the Air District aspires to that, as do we all, but we've, we've got a lot of work in front of us to make sure that happens. And PM 2.5 of the ozone or PM 2.5, both are dangerous, but PM 2.5 is the, the threat for people with asthma or people with uh, chronic lung disease or for people who have heart disease. It's the one most likely to trigger attacks uh, for people. Thank you. Okay, Kevin, I think your comment will be noted and we're documenting it in our notes to ensure that um, the Air District has access to that. Thank you. Uh, Joanna, uh, Victor, and there's uh, Enrique and several folks on that. You can unmute yourself and share your comment. Um, sí, este, quería, ahorita que estaban hablando de la localidad donde poner para testear, no sé si se pudiera entre, ¿quieren poner un colegio? Ahí donde está la escuela de Greenway y la high school. Y ahí esa área hubo un problema mucho de, de gas, ¿verdad? Y quería ver si podían hacer, a ver qué tipo de, de tóxicos hay ahí. 
porque lo que me di cuenta, mi niño personalmente tiene uh, sangramiento de nariz seguido y, y es crónico. Y estuve ayudando a unas uh, child care providers y miré que varios niños tienen ese mismo problema que mi niño y se lo echan que al sol, no, luego es invierno y sigue el problema. So, yo digo que ha de haber una alta concentración de aire malo por, por la escuela de Greenway. Porque sí me di cuenta de eso. Ahora que estuve ayudando a proveedoras, y no sé si, si estarían de acuerdo en monitorear esa área de las escuelas de los niños. Está la high school y está también la escuela de Greenway. We just received a, um, a comment from Ms. Victor, uh, from Joanna. Um, there are several on the line, but she says that we should add a monitor around uh, Greenway by the high school. She says that her child has had nosebleeds and that sometimes they want to attribute it to the weather, but in reality, it's going on. It's something that is ongoing. So she is wondering if it would be worth it to monitor the area, especially um, there are several providers that are working in that area and it would be good to have monitors around the school to make sure that they are um, in, in know-how of what type of contaminants could be in the air. Yeah, so most definitely those are the, the great comments uh, and, and information that we would like to, to get from, the, uh, uh, from you all. And I, you, you live here, you're the experts of, of where some of these concerns are. And those are the items that we're gonna talk about in, next, in the next meeting so that we have more time to identify all maybe various situations like that. So, so we know where, where we would like to place the, uh, the air monitors and what type of air monitoring equipment we should place. And like, like I mentioned, and like Kevin um, reiterated, I fully think, well, and one of the things I'll just add is in addition to the concerns that you all brought up, we also will help identify on the maps where those, um, what we call sensitive receptors, but essentially where the schools are located so that you can really see um, where, you know, if we want to monitor where our sensitive populations like children are breathing, um, we can kind of use that as our guide as we work through that exercise. Thank you. Uh, with that, we can go to Jesus Alonso. You can unmute yourself and share your comment. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry if I missed the answer to this question. I know uh, we were hearing a lot about, or yeah, we were hearing a lot about uh, pesticides concern. I don't know if this is the, the opportunity to talk about pesticide monitoring uh, and potentially seeing that, that opportunity in, uh, in the following meeting, um, but that is uh, definitely something that, that our community needs. I, I think I, because I, you're right, we, we've heard that a couple of times this meeting. I think our action item are couple, twofold. One is um, we are going to, of course, to Gustavo's earlier, uh, Gustavo Jr.'s earlier point, bring DPR, you know, into the fold, into this process to help understand historically if there's been pesticide monitoring specifically in the community to talk about that. We can also, of course, as, as we have been, any of the comments that come up through this exercise that identify pesticides maybe as, as being part of that, we can also communicate that to DPR, um, you know, as as we would any other um, issue that comes up that's maybe not part of the, the specific purview of the 617 work, but certainly we know that 617 is about this collaboration between all the different agencies and we can certainly bring DPR to the mix. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was a related question and perhaps that's the same answer, Jessica, around uh, what monitor is used for pesticide exposure? And I know there was a, a small answer on there, but wanted to know if you had anything else to add or if that's for the present future topic. Yeah, I think I think we've already kind of touched up on that, that that's really in the purview of uh, Department of Pesticides. So um, we'll we'll leave it to that part because it is, it is a fairly complex set of uh, equipment and, uh, mm -hmm. and all of that, it gets very complicated. And it's similar, similar to some of the other stuff, it gets sent off to like a laboratory. So there is a little bit of a different approach, but certainly 
like we've done with other communities, we'll bring the experts here and we'll have them answer for that and they can give you guys a way better answer. Wonderful, thank you. And then just to catch up on some of the comments in the chat and then we'll go to Kevin. Um, I, Christine um, Vitarelli said that they can offer a couple of secure outdoor locations in the air monitoring equipment in Arvin if it's helpful. So thank you, Christine, for that. We're noting your comment. Um, and there was a recent comment now. Um, can monitors be used for idle wells or non-operational wells? Yeah, so we can pretty much monitor any location where we have access to electricity. And I think the other question there is at that location where we're monitoring, is, 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 it, is the wind really, or is the emissions coming from the well going to that, that direction? So let's say if there's a residence that's nearby a well and, um, and need to, you need to monitor that area there, then yeah, we can definitely, as long as we can find a location with power and that's has security, that's safe uh, for the equipment. Thank you. We had another comment from Laura Rosenberger, and there was like a little bit of a back and forth conversation there. Um, so I'll mention, uh, they mentioned the PM monitors should record the wind direction every few minutes. I don't know if there's any response to that, but just noting that comment. Thanks, Laura. And Kevin, we can go to you and then we'll transition to the next item in the agenda after that. Well, I just want to come back to pesticides. So, in fact, the California Air Resources Board is regularly contracted to do the pesticide monitoring for DPR. So that's that's important to know as they have access to that data. And the second thing is the Air District is responsible for regulating volatile organic compounds, which are the gas part of pesticides in their development. and how they're applied. So I, I think it's, it's, it's not fair to say the Air District doesn't have any role here. Uh, no one disagrees that the monitoring technology isn't expensive, uh, time consuming and all of those things. But I think this, this conversation is taking place across the region and in some places across the state. Uh, if my uh, Gustavo knows this, the CCEJN is very involved in this conversation. Uh, and the state has just allocated millions of dollars toward this. So uh, it, it certainly develops, deserves a place in these plans. And uh, we need to get the people who are responsible for that, both from California Air Resources Board and if needed from DPR to maybe talk about how's that monitoring done, when is it done, and where can people find the, the information, which is public, mm -hmm. uh, if you can dig it out. <laughs> which most people have a hard time doing and maybe share some examples of that with the CSC so that they can do their own looking and their own research on that and see what kind of crops around them are being monitored because it's not all crops either. It's mm -hmm. just some and they're selected every year in a rotation. Uh, and it depends on what kind of pesticides being applied. So I don't see why the Air District can't act as a go-between to bring those folks into the you know, to this table yeah. uh, to talk about that work. It sounds like there's a great interest in that on the part of the CSC. Yeah, and like yeah. like I said, I think a couple of times, and then Michelle even iterated in the chat, we're 100%, that is our, our commitment to all of you to bring the Department of Pesticide Regulations, the CARB, the state, um, and Michelle, like I said, noted that in the chat, and I think we're committed. And I like I told Gustavo, keep us accountable. That's his role as a co-lead, so he's going to make sure we follow up on that. Well, and especially to really say which which parts of the pesticide is the air district responsible to regulate, because those those gases can go on to form ozone, and ozone is a very dangerous pollutant that's regional that causes a lot of chronic health problems long term. So it's important to know where is the air district's responsibility there, and what's being done about it, and does that need to be strengthened? in the Arvin Lamont uh, AB617 area. So I think it, I get the feeling that we're kind of dodging that conversation. So, so let's not do that and bring that back to the group uh, so that they know what, what percent or what part is 
certainly within the purview of the Air District to keep track of and make rules about. Uh, so it sounds, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, looking at the clock, it's 645 and we have a few more things to get to. So I'm gonna ask Emma and Bianca uh, to, we see your hands are raised. Uh, we are gonna definitely um, include this as an action item for us to continue discussing. If you're able to type in your question in the chat, um, the folks can respond through there. Um, and if there's some time later, we could come back to them as well. So thank you again for your incredible engagement tonight. Um, so many good questions and comments. Um, with that, again, thank you to our speaker, Ty. Really appreciate you and, and your insights. We're gonna transition to uh, begin wrapping up uh, the meeting, but with some um, up discussion about agenda item topics, I'm gonna kick us off with a few announcements and then uh, turn it over to a couple of people who also have some more information to share. And I'll keep this uh, brief. Uh, and want to make sure every single person here knows that uh, November, uh, the November meeting has been rescheduled because of the Thanksgiving holiday. So it, the meeting is now November uh, 17th from 5 to 7. And just remember that you'll be using the new link that you used um, there's going to be a new link for the future meeting. So uh, make sure to look at the email that comes through from the Air District that will have the appropriate information. Again, reach out to us if you have questions about the Zoom links and we can send it directly to you. Um, and we, so people decided on this uh, new meeting date using a doodle poll. And we also want to let you know that for December, it also falls your regular scheduled meeting falls on the holiday so we will be rescheduling that one as well so look out for your email there's going to be another doodle poll uh, so that you can give your preference for the meeting date and if you don't know how to use the poll or you want some support with that uh, the district also makes phone calls to help with that and if you do want some assistance with the poll itself you want to learn how to use it we're always happy to help you with that so definitely let us know um a quick announcement from Harder and Company is around the stipends. Uh, you will have uh, this this month will be the first month that Harder and Company issues the stipend, um, either check or direct deposit. We'll give you more details in an email with all of the information that you need. We're working with the Air District to get that all in order. So if you do have um, questions after that email goes out, you can uh, communicate with us. Um, via email or, or phone. Um, at this time, I'm just going to display briefly some of the action items that were uh, that our team is capturing. And as we've had various conversations, we are taking notes and also these action items on here. Um, in the interest of time, we're not going to go through them all in detail, but I'm sharing them here um, now so that you can um, see what we captured and, you know, know that we are going to uh, keep track of the status of those actions so that they are, you know, actionable. And the Air District will be updating this table that you see here uh, to, you know, put updates on what has been done for these different action items. So I'm going to go to this next page here so that you can see there's a, quite a few um, actions and you can see that our team is typing um, and they're typing the interpretation team is also translating them live and um, updating that as well. So uh, these will be published on the website at some point, uh, but again, directly what's included on in real time, you will have access to that. Great, with that, I will turn it over to Gustavo that has um, also an announcement to make and uh, gauge your um, input on, on a specific topic. Yes. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, just, I think in the sen in the essence of like unity and, and the fact that we're all together, uh, at, you know, in the very beginning, we, we moved from uh, being Arvin and Lamont individually for AB 617 and expanding the boundaries to including community like Hilltop, Fuller Acres, uh, Weed Patch, uh, um, the Van Vineland School District uh, area, and a lot of really small, very micro communities, right, uh, that are in this region. 
And so the proposition was because I mean we're, we're we've done such amazing work to expand the boundaries, uh, to change the name of AB six one seven Arvin Lamont to AB six one seven South Kern in general. And as I understand it, it will change absolutely nothing other than the fact that the title will be more inclusive of our region, right? Because now we're we're a corridor, we're an entire region. It's not just one or two communities. It's it's a corridor of communities. Uh, that shares, you know, uh, the topography shares the sources, uh, permitted sources of pollution, shares, you know, major major uh, crossways of transportation. Um, so in that, in in the spirit of solidarity, uh, uh, and if there is no great opposition, changing the name from AB six one seven Arvin and Lamont to AB six one seven South Kern. Um, right, and and so I want to want to put that out there to see what folks think about it, uh, if it's okay, uh, or if there's a discussion that needs to happen, uh, or if there's something that we could just simply agree on. Uh, and again, it won't technically won't change anything other than just the title itself, uh, inviting a more inclusive conversation. Cool. Yeah. Thumbs up. I see Emma. Awesome. I'm going to put my thumbs up up there as well. I second the request. So I do just want to clarify that um, it's, we're not doing a formal vote at this time. We're mostly gauging your interest to see if there's unanimous consensus. It sounds like if there if there isn't, um, you know, it sound, doesn't sound like you would move forward with it right away. But, um, you know, if people have comments about whether they agree or not uh, you can like you mm -hmm. said either put it in the thumbs up or or share um yeah. i see gustavo you have your hand raised feel free to unmute yourself yeah i i like um that idea i think that's uh it was mentioned it's more inclusive and also for the last 10 years we have been working with uh building healthy communities, uh, and we call building healthy communities South Kern. So South Kern already have some branding, and I think uh, this is a good idea to be more inclusive. Uh, uh, and I think uh, um, it's, it's, it is a good idea. I support the idea. I will, Jesus Alonso? Yeah, I just wanted uh, to express my, my my full support for this idea. Uh, as a lo lifelong Lamont resident, uh, I've always felt we have always been one community, uh, both sharing the the air quality and, and and what's great about our communities as well. So absolutely uh, combining us as South Kern works for me. Thank you, Jesus and, and Senor Gustavo a moment ago. Any other comments to this proposal, Jessica? I just want to clarify in case there was confusion. Um, this would not be, and I, Gustav already mentioned it, this would not be any work on any part. It would actually maybe even just verbally um, not only sound more inclusive, but I, I do think that um, it would just be in, in name only in the sense that um, it's not going to delay any process. So I don't know if people were make, thinking that it might delay any implementation, um, but that's not the case, so. Any other comments around this name change um, from anyone else? Maria and Roberto? Sí, solamente decirles que nosotros apoyamos lo que dice Gustavito. Somos una comunidad y somos una comunidad unida para todo lo que estamos trabajando. Entonces, a mí me parece muy bien que, que se ponga así. Yes, I just want to support what Gustav Vito just said. We uh, are all working together. We are all one community and we are all here in support. Great. Thank you for that. There's other comments in the chat. Uh, Carlos Ramirez in full support in the amendment of the name. Um, and then I see another hand raise. So Jesus Perez, you can unmute yourself. 
Yes, I think uh, changing the name wouldn't be as good of an idea. I think right now, AB 617 Arvin and Lamont brings a positive um, message to the communities that surround Arvin and Lamont. And we've had so much negative, so much negative news uh, uh, surrounding these communities that this is something positive. Um, so that's why I think we should leave the names as they are. Um, they are the biggest communities um, in the South Kern area, if you will. Um, and I think we need all the positive, um, all the positive PR that we that we can that we can handle right now. Um, thank you. So thank you so much, Jesus, for that. Um, Gustavo, I'm going to look to you, but um, it sounds like maybe there is a little bit more to talk about um, before um, having full consensus. Yeah, what does that mean? Um, I'm just looking at you to see if you're open to having this in a future discussion to talk yeah, no, about. Yeah, further. for sure. And the last thing that we want to do is like take up any time at all. Uh, and it was just, you know, because we already use because the unity of South Kern really is driven obviously by largely by the comités in Arvin and Lamont, and we all universally understand and know that and acknowledge that, uh, honor it. And uh, South Kern is really kind of just uh, uh, bringing together this large coalition of folks that live in this corridor, right? But if it's gonna be a distraction and folks like have, have deals with it, that's totally fine. It was just, uh, you know, like the probability of, of you know, of, just doing a simple name change just for verbiage sake. Uh, but if it's gonna be very like distractive, it seems like the vast majority of folks uh, are okay with it. Uh, I'm totally fine having a, a, a discussion even offline if that's a, if that's uh, needed or even like during the, the co-lead or, or the agenda mm -hmm. setting meetings, like that's totally fine. We could, I would love to actually to have a, that discussion. Uh, but the last thing I want is to have uh, any kind of like side distractions and, you know, really uh, distract us from the main goal, right, which, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, is to start putting down these monitors, start thinking about strategies and all that good stuff. If I may really quickly, you know, I think I do, I do think it's important to recognize the disappointment that um, there is opposition to this because the refinery, which causes a lot of the contamination, is right across the street from Fuller Acres, Lamont. I'm sorry, Fuller Acres Hilltop. And that source of pollution has affected um, Lamont, it has affected Arvin, and the trailers that go through those uh, corridors affect all three of the communities. And, you know, I, I, I would be very disappointed in myself if I did not mention that throughout this time, I have seen some op oppositions between uh, communities. And I think in order for us to be able to move forward in a collective way, we do need to be united as, as Gustavo mentioned from the beginning. Um, so I understand the need to have positive PR, um, but we can do that while still um, giving positive PR to Fuller Acres, Hilltop, Arvin Lamont, Weepatch, and all of the other communities that Gustavo mentioned. Um, I, I think um, I would really encourage everyone, um, Jesus, to uh, reconsider. You know, this is not an attack in any way, um, but I, I do think it's a, it's a loss if we don't, come together to, to fix this issue for our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, Jessica, go ahead. I was just going to offer, I agree uh, with Gustavo, we definitely have a lot to get to. So I will just commit ourselves to work with uh, folks uh, outside of the meeting. And then maybe if, if possible, if we wanted to also try to do this at the end, if there's time at the next meeting to see if there's another consensus, if that's what we build toward, I agree, this is not this is now like more time than we wanted to spend on it because I do agree there's a, a lot to get done, um, but we I will commit to working with Gus and Bianca on the side. Thank you. Um, and Jesus Alonso, I'm going to ask if you wanted to write your comment in the chat for now and, and again, invite you to the conversation in other spaces to contribute. Thank you so much. Um, with that, I do want to bring back to the screen the action items and uh, because as part of our accountability, we said we would uh, read these out loud as well. Um, and so we're coming back to them for a moment and Liz from our team is gonna go through them uh, briefly. Hello everyone. So I think we have a total of 12 action items that have come out from this meeting today. The first is the Air District will send slides summarizing air monitoring data from the Shafter community. 
the Air District will follow up with the CSC and provide information about the specific health impacts of each pollutant. Gus can share data from his air monitoring work with CCEJN, with Sal and any other interested CSE member. The Air District will contact the Department of Pesticide Regulation to see what work has been done monitoring pesticides in the area, and we'll share that with the CSE. CSE members should expect to receive materials about air monitors from the Air District in advance of the November meeting. The Department of Pesticide regulation will be invited to attend and present at future CSE meetings to ensure that there is a clear understanding of pesticide regulation and monitoring happening in Arvin and Lamont. CARB will also coordinate with DPR to follow up on the pesticide concerns. At future CSE meetings, to ensure our future CSE meetings will ensure accountability and transparency on the roles of CARB, DPR, and local air district in monitoring pesticide pollution. The CSE will receive a doodle poll to vote on a new date for the December CSE meeting due to the holidays. Carter and company will send an email to the CSE to share information about how the stipends will work going forward. The CSC is invited to consider changing the AB 617 name to South Kern to be more inclusive of the entire community. And finally, co-lead Gustavo and the Air District will meet with CSC members individually to learn more about the resistance to changing the name to South Kern. And thank you, everyone. I hope you have a really good night. Thank you, Liz. Uh, with that, um, I would like to turn it over to um, Jessica in a moment to share anything else on the upcoming topics. But for now, the suggested topics have been the placement of air monitoring equipment, as folks have mentioned tonight, and also an overview of enforcement and permitting. Anything else you would add, Jessica? today look forward to um, getting you all of these great action items moving forward and uh, have a great night I know we're a little over time wonderful I, I did just want to um, you know in in the interest of having the public comment option um, I know we are a little bit over time but I do want to make an invitation for anyone from the public that does want to make a comment um, you may still do so we want to respect your five minutes allocated so if you do have a comment uh, you can raise your hand at, at this time. Okay, Jesus. Hi, uh, just wanted to make a quick announcement. On the 29th, which is Friday, the Harvest Festival put on by the uh, Jennifer Wood and uh, some community partners is uh, happening Friday, drive through um, style. So you're, take your kids. Um, they're going to be giving away uh, goodies, candies, um, just be sure to brush your, <laughs> brush your teeth after uh, consuming all that candy. But uh, it'll happen on the 29th this Friday at uh, Bear Mountain Park, which is 10300 San Diego Street in Lamont, California. All communities are invited. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Jesus Alonso? Uh, just real quick, uh, I just want to touch back on uh, what we just had just mentioned was uh, uh, I, I say we should just take a quick vote on on the name in the next in the following meeting. I think inclusivity is, is extremely important. Uh, you know, we are more than just Lamont Narvin. So uh, we shouldn't we should make the effort to include everyone who's in the CSC. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Um, I would like to go really quick to whoever is on iPhone currently. I'm going to ask for you to unmute so that you can let us know who you are. Before this meeting ends, we want to make sure who this is so that we can give you proper attendance uh, uh, and document it correctly. So I'm going to ask iPhone to unmute themselves. We've been trying to reach you tonight to find out who you are. So if you are, your name says iPhone. Um, can you unmute yourself and let us know who you are? Daniela, um, Elvia Garcia is saying that it is her. Okay. Thank you so much, Yesenia. We'll go ahead and Thank document you. that. Perfect. Uh, Marta Lopez, you may unmute yourself and share your comment. Hola, buenas noches. Eh, solo quiero agradecer todo el equipo de trabajo en favor de nuestras comunidades. Muy agradecida. 
Y también este, constantemente tengo el interés de tener como en papel toda la información porque se me hace bastante información mm. y muy interesante. Por ejemplo, ahorita no la, la conclusión que dio Liz de los 12 puntos de acción que tenemos para trabajar, de qué manera puedo obtener yo este, la información de, de cada reunión, por favor. Hi, good evening, says Miss Marta. Uh, she is letting us know. Thank you so much for making this meeting so accessible. Uh, she is also letting us know that the information that is shared is great. And she wants to know how she can receive this information in a written format because it is great information. For example, the 12 points shared, uh, she, she would love to have that information handy. I can start by saying that we are in the process. Uh, we heard your feedback at the last meeting and we are in the process of working with the Air District on uh, publishing these on the same website where you find the agenda. So you will be able to see these action items and you will also be able to see progress that's made on the actions the Air District will document and track all their progress and add notes to the, to the same document that has those action items. Thank you, Marta. With that, we'll go to uh, our... Hola, mi nombre. Ajá. Uh, uh, okay, siga. Sí. Uh, mi nombre es José, José Odón Chávez. Uh, mi comentario es nada más de que, eh, pues, dar las gracias de que la interpretación o el, la forma de que están, lo están haciendo, me, lo están, en esto, que la calidad está mejor. Y pues, sí, también igual, como también a mí te, sí me gustaría también que, como dice, no, so, no solo Arvin y Lamont, sino que todos, pues como los demás compañeros de aquí, yo también formo parte de CBA, para que pues, pues a otras comunidades también uh, es, uh, entren también en el, en el mismo sistema que tenemos nosotros, porque todos estamos involucrados en lo mismo, que es que tenemos toda la, todo, uh, toda la contaminación uh, de, en, aquí en todo el sur de aquí de nosotros. Gracias. Hi, good evening. My name is Jose, and I just want to say, I, I want to give thanks, and I want to say that the interpretation has been uh, better. We greatly appreciate it. And I also want to say that I also want to make sure that I am represented as part of the community. It's not just Arvin and Lamont. I am also a part of the community. I want to make sure that it is noted. Thank you. And Chad Bell, did you still have a comment? I was just going to ask if it's possible to just set up a doodle poll for the name change, but it seems like there's going to be further discussion on that in reading the chat. So yes. uh, I guess we'll just continue the discussion. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. With that, everyone, um, thank mm -hmm. you again for this really great engagement. And uh, we hope you have a really great night. Uh, Gustavo or Jessica, anything else to say? Nothing from me, Gustavo, Bianca. No, oh, thank you all so much. Uh, thank you all for the dedication and I very much look forward to the next meeting. Bianca, Anina. anything from you? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, cut in. That person with the iPhone, that is not Elvia. So if we want to make sure that the person gets counted correctly, if they can please let us know who iPhone it is, uh, whose iPhone it is. It is not Elvia. Did we She's catch calling... Elvia somewhere else? Yeah, she's on the AT&T conference line, okay. which is so gonna, separate from Zoom. I'm going to call it phone again and ask that they unmute themselves. iPhone, soy Jose Ojeda. We got you, Jose. We are looking for another uh, iPhone. There were several tonight. So I'm, I'm, if you are on your computer and um, or on your phone, you should see a, a feature that says um, that we're asking for you to unmute yourself. So it's, it's just labeled iPhone. Yeah, I'm Salvador Partida. I'm in an iPhone. We got you, Sal. We're looking for one more person. There were three tonight, and we're not able, we haven't been able to capture who that third person there you is. They just unmuted. Perfect. Hi. Hi. Who is this? Hi, can you hear us? We hear you. We heard you a moment ago. We just need to identify who you are so that we can uh, mark you in the attendance sheet. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. All right. It sounds like we identified okay, as Alma. 
Thank you so much. And uh, thank you everyone for your time today. Have a great night. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Buenas noches. Buenas noches a todos. Good night, everybody. Um, I'm sorry. Buenas noches, vecinos. Buenas noches. Good night, Buenas noches. neighbors. Thank you and good night. May I have an email? Buenas noches y muchas gracias. Buenas noches. Good night and thank, thank you. you. I feel like Emma's asking a question. Sorry, yeah, I was just. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Emma, sorry, we'll come to you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I was just um, asking for an email for Harder and Company, please. Oh, yes. I'll go ahead and um, type it in the chat. Thank you. Gracias, chao. Adiós. Cámara de Enriquito quiere decir thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for all the hard work. Thank you, Bianca. We appreciate you. That last goodbye was the lady's grandson. He wanted to go on screen and say goodnight. It was oh, cute. It's very cute. Um, you can go ahead and stop the stream. Yes. Please. Okay. Yeah. Emma, I typed it in the chat. And so this is a general um, email that you, we have for our team. So all of us will be able to see your email come through. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you, you too. Bye, Emma. Thank you. Thanks, team. Good job. Yella, would you turn off our live stream? I